Hello, everyone. Welcome to session five of this training course. Today, we're going in depth with the motor encoders and the brake rectifiers that we offer. And I'll show you some helpful points about connecting these accessories. One of the most common troubleshooting calls we get are when a motor is drawing high current. One of the first things we recommend to check when that happens is the brake electrical circuit. So I'll show you what that process looks like in case you ever find yourself troubleshooting high motor current. We'll end this session by showing the different types of motor terminal block configurations you can see on our standard motors. And I'll show you how to interpret those connection diagrams. Let's start by talking about our encoder nomenclature and how it's connected. We discussed it in the last training session, but we have a wide selection of encoders to choose from. Our encoders will follow a four character naming style. The first letter will tell what type of encoder it is, such as being an incremental, absolute, or a resolver. The next letter is the type of output shaft the encoder uses. This will vary based on how the encoder will connect to the rotor of the motor. The number represents the series of the encoder. The one series was an older version used on the DT and DV motors. For the past several years, our DR motors used the seven series encoders. And starting this year, we are releasing the eight series encoders for the DR motors. The series number is important because it usually represents mechanical differences in the shaft design. For example, if you have an old DT motor and needed to replace the encoder, you wouldn't be able to install a seven series encoder on the old motor. You would need to replace the encoder with the same series if it's still available, or you would have to replace the whole motor so it can use the new series encoders. The last letter is for the type of signal the encoder outputs. Some of these output signals are only possible with the resolver or absolute encoder. Here are two pictures of some encoders that could be installed on our motors. I'll give you some time to see if you can determine the model type of these encoders. Do you think you found the model types? The top picture is an ES1S, which is the older series encoder. The number off to the right is the part number that would show on the bill of material to assemble the motor. The bottom picture is of the AS7W or an AV7W. This label is applied by the encoder manufacturer and it could be used on the spread shaft or solid shaft version. So that's why two SAW model types are listed. These other model types you see on the label are from the encoder manufacturer and not SAW. We do maintain a list of these, so if you can't find the SAW model type and only have the encoder manufacturer's model type, we can look up what encoder that is if you contact your local SAW office. Here's another question for you, and I'll give you some time to see if you can figure out a sneaky difference between these two encoder styles. Do you think you found it? I wanted you to find that the encoder channels placement have changed between these two encoders. What you're looking at is the old series encoders on the left. They used a built-in terminal strip and the order of the channels from left to right were A, B, C, A naught, B naught, and C naught. The new encoders use this removable cover with a plug connector and the order of the channels are A, A naught, B, B naught, C, and C naught. You'll also see an addition of this D channel, but that is only used on our absolute encoders for the data channel. These new style connection covers can be used on several different types of encoders, 
So that's why it's included on the terminal strip, even if it's not used. This difference could be easily missed, which would present a problem when replacing an old motor to a new motor. For example, if you took a picture of the old wiring, you may not notice that the channel labels have moved positions. And if you connected the new encoder, just like the picture of the old encoder, you would have wires landed on the wrong terminal. Thankfully, the voltage and reference terminals haven't moved positions. So landing the encoder channels in the wrong order doesn't usually damage it, but the Mobi drive will certainly issue faults until the order is corrected. So when you replace an old series encoder with the new series that uses a plug connection cover, this is how the wiring will be moved. These colors are accurate for some of the common encoder cables we offer, but if you don't use this cable, your channel colors probably won't match this, but it's still useful to visualize how the channels relocate from one to the other. The first terminal labeled UB is the supply voltage and it lands on the same location. The upside down T is the reference terminal for the encoder and it lands in the same location as well. Next is the A channel of the encoder and these three terminals will stay in the same order when going from the old encoder to the new. The next channel the new encoder needs is A0. Then channel B can be moved. Then B0. Next is channel C. Then C0. The plug connection cover will also have the D channel, and this will only be used on the absolute encoders. If you use one of our encoder cables, it may include the D channel wires, and you can land the wires on the terminals to keep the wiring tidy, but it would only be used if the encoder was absolute. When using sensitive devices like encoders, electrical interference is something that always has to be managed, so the encoder signal can be read properly. Let's discuss what this is and how we can manage it. There are multiple different ways that electrical interference can occur, but here are some common ones. The first is a radiating magnetic field that comes from a cable carrying current. The LS represents that all cables will have some level of inductance that is unavoidable. The cable inductance gets larger the longer the cable run is and the higher the frequency of the AC voltage. This magnetic field is proportional to the current. So the higher the current flowing through the cable, the larger the magnetic field will be. You could imagine if you routed sensitive cables directly beside this cable, that it would be affected by this magnetic field. Another way to have interference is the capacitance that exists between parallel cables and a ground potential. As the voltage in the cables rise and fall, energy is added and removed from this parasitic capacitance that exists between the cables. And these capacitances have negative effects on the circuit's performance. Another type of interference comes from variable frequency sources like inverters. There is leakage current that needs to flow across the earth ground to return to the inverter. If there is poor connection to ground, these currents can escape the inverter circuit and cause problems to other devices. Most of these interferences can't be completely eliminated, but since we know that these will occur in some way, we can change how equipment is installed to manage the negative effects. In a lot of the scenarios that create interference, the ground potential is an important aspect to connect correctly, so the unwanted interferences can be dealt with. In this image here, the green and yellow lines represent a grounding concept between all the conveyors, the inverters, electrical cabinet, motors, and the physical earth ground connection. When working with AC circuits, there is a value called impedance. This is measured in ohms, and with AC circuits, it represents how the circuit will oppose current flow through it. The reason this grounding circuit has so many connections and parallel cable runs is so it has the lowest possible impedance, which helps maintain the same earth potential at all the connections. If the grounding circuit has high impedance or unequal earth potentials, 
the interference voltages will take the path of lowest impedance to return to their sources. This means the interference voltages will not flow across the ground and instead will find pathways on other non-ground circuits to get back to their power sources, which causes problems on these other circuits. This is why it's called an interference voltage. Sometimes these interference voltages can be large enough to cause premature failure of components. So properly reducing these effects is not only to have clean voltage, but to also extend the life of many electrical circuits in the application. This is a high level overview, so let's zoom into these connections and see what they look like. When routing power, signal cables, and ground cables across a machine, they should be housed in some type of cable management system like tray or conduit. When connecting the different sections of this cable management, it should be joined over a large surface area. You can see this in the T-junction of this tray that it is secured together so it can't separate and the connection overlaps for a greater surface area. This other example of making a T-junction is not correct. The surface area connection has been reduced to a single wire which greatly increases the impedance, and the connection between the trays is not secure. These gaps in the tray like this give an area for electromagnetic interference to have a pathway in or out of the cables inside. If the cables need to route through a solid object, like a wall or a piece of equipment, it's recommended to have the cable management go through the space as well, so the connection over a large surface area is maintained. Here's an incorrect example of carrying cables through a solid object because the area where there is no cable management, the cable will have EMI effects either in or out. Connecting the cable management in such a way over a large surface area is called bonding. If the bond is kept unbroken, the cable management can act as a barrier to reduce EMI effects from coming into the cables and from leaving the cable management if the cables are producing EMI. Also, the cable management will be bonded to earth ground points so that any interference voltages traveling along the metal structure can have a pathway to earth. In a lot of installations, it's not possible to run the cable management all the way to the motor or inverter. In those situations, it's recommended to connect these high frequency braid to cables from the housing of the motors to the cable management that the cables come from. These bonding cables aren't just regular power cable. The material and surface area has been designed to have a low impedance for dissipating high frequency interference voltages. If we bond the cable management to the downstream devices, all the way back to the electrical cabinet, we will get a bonding plan that looks like this. You can see that the cable management is unbroken and in any spots where it's not continuous, it was joined over a large surface area. At the electrical cabinet, the inverter's mounting back plane and the cable management all get connected to a common earth ground bus bar so they have the same potential. Inside the cable management, the cables aren't carelessly placed in it. As an example, if you had an encoder cable and a low voltage signal wire, you could route them in the same cable management, but you would need to separate them as far as you can. If you are also running brake power and motor power, these can be in their own cable management as well, but they would also need separation. You would want to avoid running any low voltage cables directly alongside high voltage cables and try to keep them as far apart as possible. Creating this separation will reduce the effects of the magnetic and capacitive fields that exist around the cables. A good grounding plan and creating cable separation will reduce the interference, but it's not the only tool we can use to manage electrical interference. The next thing we can do is use shielded cable. The shield that surrounds the cable acts as a Faraday cage, which limits radiation out and interference in. 
There are different methods to connect shielded cable, and if you read articles on the internet, you will see varying opinions and recommendations. One method to connect shielded cable is to only bond one side of the cable shield to the ground and leave the other end of the shield not bonded to anything. This method is only effective for the capacitive voltage that exists between parallel cables, but it is ineffective against magnetic fields. So you may see this in low frequency environments, but it's not the best suited for industrial environments that have a mix of low and high frequency voltages. Also, it's only usable with short cable distances, which limits its effectiveness in a lot of industrial applications. With that being the case, there is a different method that is called double side shielding. This method better manages parasitic capacitances over longer distances, and it is an effective method to manage magnetic interference. If you connect the shielded cable at both ends, you can actually route motor cables and encoder cables in the same cable management because their shields protect the conductors inside the cable. In the majority of applications, we recommend if you are using shielded cable to connect the shield at both ends. Now I will preface that majority doesn't mean every application because shielding is not a one size fits all solution. There are some applications that are not good candidates to use shielded cable. For example, if the motor cable length is very far from the inverter or there are multiple motors being driven by a single inverter, if shielded power cable was used over those long distances, it could actually cause other electrical issues. So deciding on when to use shielded cable will vary depending on the application. Our MoviDrive system manual has pages in the project planning section that lists the maximum cable distances for shielded and unshielded cable that vary depending on the kilowatt rating on the MoviDrive and what PWM frequency the MoviDrive will be set to. All of the motor and encoder cables that SW sells will come shielded. If the cable came with a plug connector, we have already connected the shield to the connector in the factory. If the other end of the cable has flying leads instead of a connector, you would need to properly connect the shield on that end to make it double side shielded. Connecting the shield properly is crucial, so let's look at some good and bad examples of shield connections. If you have shielded cables coming into the electrical cabinet, sometimes the easiest way to bond it is by carefully cutting back the insulation to expose the braided shield. This allows the shield to be clamped over a large surface area, which is bonded to the back plane of the electrical cabinet. There are strain release very close to the shield area so that the cable isn't accidentally pulled out of this clamping area. It's important to not make jumper wires to the shield or unwrap strands of the shield to connect it. Doing this increases the impedance value of the shield, which can make the entire shield ineffective even if it's connected at both ends of the cable. This is the proper connection over a large surface area with unpainted metal. To connect the motor and encoder ends of the cable, you can use EMC rated cable glands and assemble it like this. This is how we connect the shield to the connectors on the cables we sell. We cut back the insulation to allow access to the shield. Then we pull the shield back like a banana over the insert and then assemble everything together which clamps the shield to the housing of the connector or conduit box of the motor. When you do this, make sure the shield doesn't get in between any threads that will screw together. These threads will cut the shield or make it very difficult to compress the cable gland to the cable. This was just an overview of electrical interference and some common things we have encountered and what could be done to manage it. This topic can be quite complex, but if you're interested in learning more, we have an engineering book dedicated to this topic. You can go to our USA website and click on documentation on the left side of the screen. 
The center of the web page will change to this screen, and you will need to select this line that says search in titles or document numbers. If you input this document number here, it will show you the PDF link where you can download this book to do your own self-study on this topic. Let's switch to a different electrical topic and discuss the brakes and rectifiers that we offer for our motors and how the electrical circuit could be connected. If you use any of our brakes that have a rated voltage greater than 24 volts, you will need some type of rectifier to control it. There are two places the rectifier can be located. It can be located in the conduit box of the motor directly beside the motor terminals. You may also see these bottle cap shaped devices screwed into the motor conduit box and they work alongside the brake rectifier for rapid brake timing. Or the rectifier can be located in the electrical cabinet and it will snap to a DIN rail. This is common when an inverter is controlling the motor or in applications where it's easier to have the rectifier closer to the voltage contactors. Let's look at how we name our brake rectifiers. We'll start with this common conduit box mounted version called the BGE 1.5. The letter B just identifies that it's a brake rectifier. The G means it's located in the conduit box. And the third letter indicates the type of the rectifier. We have many different versions here to support different time responses and wiring diagrams. So this will change based on how the rectifier is ordered. The letter E means that this rectifier supports rapid timing if you follow the wiring diagram to switch it from normal response to rapid response. The two numbers in the end that are separated by a decimal place are actually the maximum amp rating for the brake holding circuit, but we use this value to indicate what voltage range the rectifier supports. Our higher voltage brakes will draw less current, so that's why a 460 volt brake uses a 1.5 amp rectifier, and a 120 volt brake would use a 3 amp rectifier. Here's the model type for a cabinet mounted rectifier. B is for the brake rectifier. M indicates it's installed in the electrical cabinet. The letter K is also a rapid timing rectifier and it has a built-in 24 volt relay that could be controlled by the inverter to switch on or off the DC output voltage to the brake. This is a very common rectifier used with the Mubi drive. And the numbers at the end are the max holding amps, which we use to assign a permitted voltage range. I quizzed you in the last session about reading the motor nameplate, so I'll give you some time on this real nameplate to see if you can find all the brake details for this motor. Do you think you found everything? The voltage on the brake rectifier needs to be 460 volts AC. The brake holding torque is 300 Newton meters. The brake rectifier that was supplied was the BGE 1.5, which is the type that mounts in the conduit box on the motor. When we assemble the brake onto the motor, we have to pass wires from the brake to the terminal strip or rectifier that's in the conduit box. What do you think these RB and RT labels are? Do you think you know what they are? These RB and RT labels represent the coils of the brake. Each one of these coils has a specific resistance that is designed with that can be measured for troubleshooting. When DC voltage passes across these coils, there is a very strong magnetic field created that can overcome the torque from the brake springs that releases the brake. 
Our brakes are electrically released and mechanically engaged. This way, if there is a loss of power, the brake would immediately engage by its built-in springs. Our brakes don't operate like automotive brakes that can have a variable torque based on how hard you're pressing the pedal. Our brakes are either electrically released or mechanically engaged with full brake torque. There is no in-between torque value unless the brake is not gapped properly and is dragging. When our motor is controlled from an inverter, the brake shouldn't be used as a working brake to stop the application. The inverter should ramp the application to a stop, and when it's time to disable the inverter, the brake should then engage to hold the load. Doing it this way will reduce wear to the brake disc. Now that we know the brake coils have a specific resistance, that information can be very helpful to know how to troubleshoot the brake coil and electrical circuit. We have tables in our manuals that show what the correct resistance should be for each type of brake that we offer. The first thing we have to know is the size of the brake. This is shown in the model type printed on the motor nameplate. Next, we have to use the rated brake rectifier voltage from the nameplate and find it on the table. The values in parentheses are the permitted AC voltage range. Then we have to look horizontally over in the table to find the RB and RT resistances. Now these resistances are based on room temperature. So if the brake is really cold or hot, these resistances may fluctuate a little but should be somewhat close to these values. Lastly, our brake operates on DC voltage from the rectifier. So this column here is to show what the maximum DC voltage level should be. If you would like to know where to find these resistance tables, we have a document on our website for this. You will click on Technical Notes tab on the left side of the screen, then change the selection to B for brakes, then click the checkbox to select the brake coil resistance data, then click View Documents at the bottom of the list to open the PDF. Before we get started, I want you to know that troubleshooting the brake can be very dangerous. There is high voltage present, and if the brake is accidentally released while troubleshooting, the machinery or voltages could kill you. The brake also gets hot enough to burn you because of the current that flows through it. You will need to be qualified in working with high voltages and need to use personal protective equipment with lockout tagout procedures for the motor and brake voltage. Also, you will need to lock the mechanics of the machine from falling or moving. The machine should be brought into a mechanically safe state before doing any brake maintenance or troubleshooting. For example, the brakes on our motors could be holding a load suspended in the air, or there could be spring tension built up in the application that the brake is holding back. If the brake is released without motor power, the load would fall, or the spring tension of the machine could release, which could be catastrophic. All right. Now that we know the RB and RT values, we have some information that will help diagnose the brake circuit. All of our brakes that use rectifiers will have three wires. We color them white, red, and blue. The white wire is center tapped between the two coils. The accelerator coil should always have a smaller resistance than the coil section. This is by design because the accelerator coil needs to create a much stronger magnetic field to overcome the brake springs. After a predefined time, the rectifier switches on the other coil section, which lowers the strength of the magnetic field and reduces the total current in the brake circuit. Doing this saves energy since high current isn't needed to keep the brake released. The placement of the brake wires on the rectifier are in a different order between the conduit box and the electrical cabinet version, so don't let that confuse you. If you just look to the wire colors, it will help to easily identify the wires and if they are connected properly. 
I do want to preface that on the conduit box rectifier, your blue wire is normally landed on terminal 5 for standard reaction, but there are other diagrams that move the blue wire to terminal 4 for rapid reaction. Also, on the electrical cabinet rectifier, you probably won't actually have red, white, and blue color wires landed. The wire colors will be whatever the installer decided to use. These wire colors are just for illustration purposes of the standard brake connection to the rectifier. You'll need to check our wiring diagrams for the rectifier you have to determine if it deviates from the standard configuration. When you measure the brake coil resistances, you have to do that with no voltage present, and you will need to unplug the brake wires from the rectifier. Once you have the wires off, you'll use a multimeter to measure between the red and white wires and compare that measurement to the RB value from the table. Then you'll measure between the white and blue wires and compare that to the RT value from the table. The total coil resistance is the sum of your two measurements. You can verify that by measuring from the red wire to the blue wire and that should equal your sum. If any of these three measurements reveal an open circuit or a short circuit, then the brake coil is damaged and needs to be replaced along with the brake rectifier since it's likely damaged as well. If you have confirmed that the brake coil resistances measure okay, then the input and output voltage of the brake rectifier circuit is another thing you can check as well. I will remind you that this is very high voltage, so you need to take the proper safety measures before checking the input and output voltages. The brake will need to be energized to check these voltages. Also, if the rectifier is in the conduit box, you may not be able to safely get a voltage measurement since this will be directly on top of the motor and the brake would need to be energized to check its input and output voltages. Once the brake releases, that means the motor or the machinery can move on you. So don't plan on this being a viable troubleshooting step for the conduit box mounted rectifiers unless you can take the motor off of the equipment to measure this safely. Also, if your voltage supply contactors are tripping, then there is likely some other circuit issue going on that needs to be resolved first before trying to measure the brake voltage. Our brake rectifiers are half wave. This means it converts the AC voltage to DC voltage and the magnitude of the DC volts will be 42% less than the line in supply. So as an example, if you input 480 volts AC to the rectifier, it should output 200 volts DC. On these BM style cabinet mounted rectifiers, Terminals 1 and 2 are the AC input, and terminals 13 and 15 are the DC output voltage. I skipped over how to measure terminals 3 and 4 because these can be AC or DC voltage inputs depending on the type of the BM rectifier. Always reference your wiring diagram for the rectifier you have to know if the terminal you are measuring will be an AC or DC voltage. To get an accurate voltage measurement, the brake wires need to stay connected. This is because the rectifier circuits need the coil resistance to switch properly. If you do find an issue with the brake coil resistance, you still have to replace the rectifier. A damaged brake coil often causes internal circuit damage to the rectifier, and if it's not replaced, a brand new brake coil could immediately be damaged by using an old rectifier. Lastly, if you don't find any issues with the brake resistance or rectifier voltages, but the brake is dragging or not releasing, then the air gap may not be set properly. There are documents on the training tab of our website that show step-by-step -step instructions on how to check and set the brake air gap if that is something you need to troubleshoot.
I will mention that we do offer other brake rectifier models that I haven't shown in these troubleshooting steps, which are for functional safety systems. You will need to contact your local regional engineering office if you have one of these type rectifiers and need assistance with it. Functional safety systems can be complex, and you shouldn't try to diagnose these systems unless you fully understand how the safety system of the machine works. Also, these type rectifiers are powered by the DC bus of the inverter, and it can have voltages above 700 volts DC going to the terminals. If you look through the documents on our website for the brakes, you may come across this technical note with a lot of connection diagrams in them. So let me show you how to understand it. I do want to mention that if the motor is controlled by an inverter, the brake rectifier cannot be connected directly to the motor terminals like this document shows, because this document is focused towards running the motor across the line. The rectifier needs a constant voltage supply, so if you see a motor with jumper wires from the brake rectifier to the terminal block, you have to remove those jumper wires and supply the power from an external source. The top row of the diagram are columns for the different combinations of motor voltage to brake voltage. It's common for across the line motors to have a 230 volt brake while the motor is wired for 460 volts. This is so the motor can be rewired for 230 volts if it needs to and the brake doesn't have to be changed. The next two rows are for two common stator diagrams. These will be shown on the motor nameplate if you're unsure if your motor is double Y, Y, or delta and Y. Lastly, these A and B labels are the stud locations where you would need to connect your brake rectifier supply if the motor was running across the line and not from an inverter. If you are using an inverter, you can still use the rectifier diagrams on the far right but the A and B wires will need to come from a constant supply instead. There are multiple different rectifier models and brake reaction times shown in this document on our website. So make sure you're looking at the diagram that matches with the type of rectifier and time response the brake is supposed to have. If there are any questions about how the motor and brake are supposed to be connected, please contact your local SAW office to supply you with the correct diagram. If the motor or brake is wired incorrectly, it's possible for it to be damaged immediately as soon as power is switched on. For the last topic of this training session, let's discuss the different types of stator wiring configurations you could see with our standard motors. For our current DR motor series, it's very common to see a six stud terminal block. This style terminal block is used in many different wiring combinations. And it may have jumper bars or it may not have them. That will depend on what the stator calls for. It's also possible to have nine stator leads landed on these six studs like shown in the center picture. Also, these terminal blocks can break if the nuts are over tightened. So when you're landing the connections, just snug the nuts down and don't twist hard on them. Otherwise, you run the risk of breaking your terminal block. Here's a photo of a real motor and the different diagrams possible with this six stud terminal block. Just by looking at the photo of the motor and the diagrams on the right, which diagram do you think is the correct one for this motor? All right, I'm going to show the answer. This motor is the R76 diagram that uses nine stator leads. Currently, it is connected for the high voltage Y connection. Now I'll ask a different question. 
Since this is the R76 connection, I can switch to low voltage double Y if the machine calls for it. So what would I need to do to change to double Y? Do you think you figured out what has to change to switch from Y to double Y? The first thing that has to change are the blue, black, and red leads have to move diagonally to the opposite studge, which calls the order of the colors to change as well. You can see these colors in the left image underneath these black power supply wires. Once those are moved, jumper bars will install where they used to be on the yellow, white and brown stator leads that only have one lead per stud. This is something commonly overlooked with our nine lead stators when switching from Y to double Y. So it's something I wanted to point out. The R13 diagram is our six lead stator and you don't have to move the stator leads since there is one lead per stud. You just change the orientation of the jumper bars to switch between delta or y. Our older DT and DD motors used to have nine stud terminal blocks, so you can see the differences here between delta and y. When you have our larger motors that are 15 horsepower or greater, they may have 12 lead stators. So you would have two six stud terminal blocks side by side in a large conduit box. Double delta is the low voltage connection. And you can see here, there are a lot of jumper wires to make that connection happen. And there will be jumper bars between the two blocks. Because of this, you can land your power supply on either side of the terminal block. The high voltage delta connection doesn't use external jumper wires, but makes the connection with jumper bars instead. In the delta connection, the terminal blocks aren't interconnected, so you can only land the power supply on one side of the terminal block. Okay, we have reached the end of this training session. We covered a lot of information and troubleshooting steps and some of the information was quite technical. We discussed our encoder and brake model types. We showed some differences in the encoder wiring and talked about the effects of electromagnetic interference and how to manage it. We discussed some methods you can use to troubleshoot the brake if it's not releasing and causing the motor to pull high current. We ended this session by showing the different types of terminal block configurations you may encounter on our standard motors and some wiring changes that are easily overlooked. In the next session, we will start our lab activity portion of this training course. And we will begin by showing you around the Motion Studio software and how to get connected to the inverter with your computer. Thank you for your attention. Take care and have a good day.